It is now time for oral questions, and I recognize the Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, Speaker, my first question this morning is uh, for the Premier. Yesterday, the Premier announced his plan to move Ontario into Phase 3. Unfortunately, the Conservatives' refusal to include a province-wide plan for childcare and education is going to make life even harder for workers and business owners in every corner of our province, because it's going to make it next to impossible for working parents to get back to work. Does the Premier accept the reality that Ontario won't be able to get back to work if working moms and dads can't rely on schools and available childcare spaces. The Minister of Education. Uh, well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. Mr. Speaker, I was proud to join the Premier, the Deputy Premier, and the Minister of Finance to announce our Stage 3 reopening, part of our broader plan to get our economy back on track. And part of that obligation, Speaker, is for the government to ensure childcare remains sustainable and accessible in every community in this province. It's why, Speaker, we have taken action in conjunction of the, working closely with the Chief Medical Officer of Health and Dr. Williams to expand those cohorts based on the incredible work of the people of this province, the risk to COVID has been reduced, and that is a demonstration of all of our collective efforts as a population. As a result, we've been able to expand that capacity going from 10 to 15. That represents, Speaker, in and around 91 per cent of pre-COVID capacity to assist those moms and dads, the very people you speak of, to ensure that they can get back to work with confidence that it remains safe. Our health protocols remain in place. Our funding remains in place to ensure childcare remains accessible and affordable for people in this province. Supplementary question. Well, Speaker, yesterday the Premier claimed that it was entirely up to school boards whether they would be able to uh, open uh, all day, all week. But last week, uh, an email to school boards made it clear that the government wasn't offering boards a choice and that boards were to adopt a model in which kids would be in school as little as two days a week. The Council of Ontario Directors of Education was told, quote, the government is not flexible on this matter. So can the Premier clear this up? Was this memo inaccurate, or did the Premier get it wrong yesterday? Minister of Education. Speaker, we need to prepare for all eventualities and adopt a prudent flexibility for whatever path this outbreak takes. It's why, Speaker, we are ensuring that in September we are prepared for three circumstances. As we see around the world in jurisdictions that have reopened their schools, in Hong Kong to Germany, we've seen risk when they have done so. We have an obligation to the people of this province to ensure to save. The member opposite, the leader of the opposition yesterday, said in a press conference attacking the minister, quote, for not knowing what September will look like. I'd like to ask the member and her supplemental, could you provide us with the transmission risk and the data of what September will look like? In the absence of knowing that risk, Speaker, we have an obligation to ensure we're prepared for every circumstance, to ensure the continuity of learning is not impeded. Yes, day-to-day -day conventional learning with heightened safety, an online option should it be required, and a hybrid of 15 kits cohort based on public health advice. This is not a time to in any way infuse a sense of politicizing the Response. circumstances. We have an opportunity to work with public health, work together as parliamentarians to keep kids safe. It's exactly what the government will continue to do. And the final supplementary. Well, Speaker, it's this government's obligation to actually put a functioning, workable plan together for parents and kids for the fall, a safe plan a safe plan, and that's going to mean investment, and maybe that's what they don't want. Maybe they think seven cents a kid is enough investment to get our kids back to school safely and our moms and dads back to work, but we don't think that that's good enough, and neither do parents, and neither do educators, and neither do children, and neither do school board speakers, so there's an announcement for the minister right there. The fact Order. is they have been left on their Order. own to confront this challenge, and they're doing their best to come up with solutions for kids. Order. But the government is not doing their part, Speaker. The boards have been clear. They're eager to return for five days a week, but they need additional funding. They need additional staff. They need additional space, and Washington. the government should be providing it. So is this government prepared to support school boards and parents that want schools open five days a week come this fall? Mr. Education. Mr. Speaker, the government continues to work with school boards under the guidance of the Chief Medical Officer of Health to ensure that when parents return their children to class in September, it is safe. That is why, Speaker, we have added $730 million more dollars in the grants for student needs to ensure that the restart is safe. 
It is why, Speaker, we've enhanced mental health funding by an additional uh, $10 million. It's why we've added more money for technology, an additional $15 million. The per pupil fundings of every single board in our province is getting more funding to ensure it is safe. But, Speaker, beyond the investment, it's about preparing for three circumstances because, like the majority of provinces within the Federation, we are unaware, unlike the member opposite, of what that risk will be with precision in September. So, to get this right, to be prudent, to be ready for all circumstances, we're asking boards to prepare for in, in class, day to day, for online and an adaptive, blended model of the two. That is the right thing to do to keep kids safe, Speaker. The next question, Leader of the Opposition. Questions, uh, thank you so much. Is, uh, is back to the Premier. But I got to say, a wait and see approach is not going to get people back to work. It's not going to get employers having their staff coming back to work because those staff are parents and they need predictability about what's happening in the fall. And what they're all saying, the majority are saying, is they want five days a week and they need childcare. And this government has been crickets when it comes to that kind of commitment. And it's their job to put something in place that is actually safe and meets the needs of students, of parents, and of the em employers of our province. And it's shameful that that hasn't happened. Wait and see is not a plan, Speaker. We need a predictable plan. In Ottawa Carleton, the parents were clear that the Premier's plan to have kids out of school for most of the week in one of their models is not going to work. It's simply not going to work. So is the Question. Premier prepared to start hiring teachers and education workers and finding more space so that the eager folks that want kids back in the schools five days a week actually get that to happen? Again, the Minister of Education reply. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the, the government, under the leadership of the Premier, is preparing for all circumstances so a child's education is not in any way undermined or impeded. We have a duty to get this right. You know, we have to ensure that public health data informs our planning. The member opposite is asserting to the government. I mean, is this the recommendation of the Democrats to plan absent public health data? We are saying to the people of this province that in order to be responsive to the risk that is not linear province-wide, that is moving each and every day, that we have to plan for all three circumstances. That is a sensible proposal to ensure that no child education is at risk in September. Because we're looking around the world, if we benchmark Ontario versus every other industrialized economy like Israel, like Hong Kong, including Germany, they have reopened with challenges. So let us learn from those lessons. Let's put the funding in place. Let's work together to keep kids in place. Thank you, Speaker. Supplementary. Thank you so much, Speaker. And, and we're waiting for that. We're waiting for funding for PPE. We're waiting for funding for more staffing. We're waiting for funding for protective uh, equipment, for transportation, for technology, for mental health supports. Seven cents a student, Ottawa Carleton Board says, is not enough. And when you look at schools in Northern Ontario, they're facing challenges too. Yesterday, teachers in the Ku Kuwait and Patricia Board told Global News that the general guidelines developed by the Minister of Education don't take into account the lack of resources in the far north. Remote schools don't have extra staff to deal with COVID-related emergencies. They can't access Wi-Fi for remote learning. Kim Douglas, a teacher in the Kuwait and Patricia Board, told reporters, and I quote, when there's no administrator on site and kids get sick, what do you do? Who's going to be responsible for that child? It's a very good question. Is the Premier ready to admit that the government's plan for schools is not working and they need to step up and provide the support that schools need? Response, Minister of Education. Thank you, Speaker. Indeed, we understand that in remote and northern communities they face increased challenges. That's why, Speaker, under the leadership of the Minister of Infrastructure, we have set aside $315 million to expand broadband in all communities in the province of Ontario. It's why I'm joining, I joined the Minister of Infrastructure to call on the federal government and the CRTC to invest and to achieve the commitment they said of high-speed internet for all Canadians. We agree and we ask them to ex expedite that delivery to help more families in remote parts of the province. Speaker, every high school in Ontario this September will have internet. In addition, Speaker, we've allocated an additional $15 million in funding for technology to procure in and around 37,000 devices. We understand the challenges within the North. It's why we're funding and investing in those communities to get them connected to the internet so that their kids could as well be learning no matter what challenges take place in the fall. And the final supplementary. 
Well, Speaker, I, I got to tell you, parents are really worried that this government is forcing them to choose between their jobs and their livelihoods or their children's education. That is an unacceptable choice. But yesterday, the Premier claimed that parents were thanking him, thanking him for being forced to quit their jobs and shell out thousands of extra dollars for childcare costs. Just like he claimed, the teachers were thanking him last year when he announced 10,000 of them would be fired. You know what? Working parents and their kids deserve so much better than this, Speaker. So will the Premier stop ignoring this crisis, agree to cover COVID-19 costs such as personal protective equipment, extra staffing, transportation, cleaning supplies, and school retrofits and maintenance, and start working with parents and school boards who want to see schools open five days a week, open safely, and make sure childcare spaces are there for parents who need them. Minister of Education. Well, Speaker, I'm very proud to be a part of a government that is investing over half a billion dollars to rebuild schools and build new schools after a decade of closure under the former Liberal government, Speaker. I'm proud to be part of a government that is investing over $1.3 billion, Speaker, in renewal, achieving what the Auditor General has required us to do of 2.5 per cent in renewal funding to ensure our schools may, are maintained and ultimately safe for kids. I'm proud to be part of a government that has increased the grant for student needs, the vehicle funding to school boards, a net $730 million, more funding for cleaning, more funding, Speaker, for technology and mental health and special education. These are the investments that are going to make a difference. And, Speaker, we've also set aside $200 million in the support for students fund to hire more educators, to hire more custodians. 2,000 more custodians can be hired in school boards as a result of that investment. We understand the importance of getting it right. We are working closely with the Chief Response. Medical Officer to do that, to keep all staff, all students safe in Ontario. Stop the clock. Order. The member for Northumberland, Peterborough South, will come to order. The member for Carleton will come to order. The member for Mississauga Streetsville will come to order. Restart the clock. The next question. Leader of the Opposition. Speaker, uh, speaker my next question is also for the Premier. Uh, this morning I met with Lisa, who is a frontline worker in our long-term care system. Lisa is a dietary aide. She spent the last four years working tirelessly to sound the alarm on the crisis in Ontario's long-term care system. And she notes that one of the key issues, one of the key factors that workers in long-term care are facing is severe understaffing, which has only gotten worse, of course, during the pandemic. Workers in our long-term care system, Speaker, are left physically, mentally, and emotionally exhausted from being stretched far, far too thin on the job, working long hours and putting literally their lives on the line for vulnerable seniors. The Premier has a responsibility, Speaker, to protect these workers by mandating a standard of care of four hours per day per resident and increasing wages for these workers Question. and protections permanently. He has to take steps forward to ensure the safety and security of these essential workers, uh, the frontline workers, are, are, are there not only during the pandemic but also afterwards. So will the Premier make a commitment to make those permanent changes for those health care heroes? Mr. Long-term care to reply. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you for the question. Our government's number one commitment is to the safety and well-being of residents and staff. And that has been consistent throughout this pandemic. It was consistent before. Every measure, every tool taken. We started as a new ministry of long-term care. Our government showed its commitment to long-term care and staff in long-term care to understand the staffing challenges. And I've stood here and said this before. We know that the ward rooms played a role. We know that the staffing crisis that was pre-existing leading into the pandemic was a serious obstacle for our homes to overcome the difficulties they were having in controlling the spread. Staffing was an issue, and our government took measures to create flexibility in the staffing, to do everything possible, a matching portable uh, uh, portals, $243 million to, uh, to help homes address the staffing. We took every measure possible. The safety and well-being of staff and residents Order. is paramount. Thank you.
The supplementary question. Sir, experts are saying that a matter of a second wave isn't an if, but rather a when. And so, while well, the government spends its time ramming legislation Order. through that Order. gives a lot of goodies to Order. their developer friends, they are doing nothing to make permanent the changes that we need to see. Stop the clock. Minister of Education, come to order. Associate Minister of Transportation, GTA, come to order. Government House Leader, come to order. Restart the clock. I apologize to the Leader of the Opposition. Speaker, these brave frontline heroes have literally given their lives, given their lives for the, in the fight against COVID-19, but it never should have come to this. We all heard that the minister went and asked for more money but was refused. We all know the Premier's claim about uh, uh, iron ring around long-term care certainly wasn't accurate. By legislating standards of care now, sustainable staffing levels now, fair wages now, the Premier can provide these workers with the safety and security that they deserve. So will the Premier listen? Will he listen to what Ontario's frontline heroes have been saying for years, which the Liberals ignored, but will they do that, adopt these measures now, change them permanently, or will we see the vulnerability continue and this deadly virus go through our long-term care system again a second time. Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you once again for the question. When our homes were affected by COVID-19, our government took every measure, and we continued to. Order. We continue the to take come every board. measure possible. Day after day, we were at work putting dollars behind emergency orders, uh, amendments to regulations, 243 million. I have asked the minister to take her seat. The Leader of the Opposition has to come to order. Minister of Long-Term Care can conclude. This is a global issue, and we will continue to do everything we can that is possible. The previous government had 21 reports highlighting staffing that a fix was needed, and they did not act. And, and you, as the Leader of the Opposition, supported that government. The House will come to order. The next question, the member for Northumberland, Peterborough South. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Heritage, Sport, Tourism and Culture Industries. Mr. Speaker, as Ontarians think about the new normal, many of them are happy to hear that they can enjoy patio season with families and friends. Mr. Speaker, when I say the new normal, and when Ontarians think about that, behind the new normal are stories. Stories like George, who came to Canada as a Greek at the age of 14 and started Olympus Burger, which became Canada's best burger that I took the Minister of Finance to last week. Or Maria and her husband, who started Railside Restaurant. Or many of the mom and pa shops who serve folks in Northumberland, Peterborough South on a day-to-day -day basis with a smile. As Ontarians explore their communities and the province this summer, businesses generated by patios will be a huge help to our food service sector and Question. the remarkable men and women that work in that sector. Mr. Speaker, can the minister please share with us just how significant Ontario's patio access and expansions are going to be to this province over the summer months? Thank you. Minister of Heritage, Sport, Tourism and Culture Industries. I want to say thank you for the hard-working member from Northumberland, Peterborough. I'm looking forward to joining him on the patio in his community. I also want to thank him and all the members of the Standing Committee on Finance and Economic Affairs who identified this as an issue early on to make sure that Ontarians could reconnect in their communities, and that's very important to our tourism sector. But, Speaker, as, as the member uh, noted, we are now in a new normal, and we want to make sure that we travel this province and we travel in our own communities as safely as possible. And I can tell you that the member um, has been obviously circulating in his community to support his community. I had the opportunity as well to join the Minister of Infrastructure, the Minister of the Environment, and the MPP from Cambridge on patios in their communities. And I can tell you 
from the contact tracing to the level of sanitization to the physical distancing that's happening in our in our areas is very safe to, to start to to uh, circulate around our communities and as we go into phase three across the rest of the province we're starting to see that even in dine-in activities so i want to say to all ontarians let's get out there let's support our local economy this has been a triple threat of a public health crisis an economic crisis but this is a great thank you very much the supplementary question Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My follow-up question is to the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Oh. Mr. Speaker, the majority of Ontario, as we moved into stage two, we're spreading the love around. Yeah. yeah. Mr. Speaker, the members opposite. <laughs> The members opposite have no plan for restaurants. They would rather give them handouts than give them a leg up, Mr. Speaker. But that's not what the hardworking businesses of Northumberland, Peterborough South want, Mr. Speaker. They want flexibility, Mr. Speaker, and a government that supports them. So, Minister, I know patio space can be especially limited in rural Ontario. So, can you tell us about steps that you've taken to help expand patio space so that these small businesses, hardworking men and women, can get back to work and that we as Ontarians can continue to enjoy their restaurants? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Municipal Affairs and Housing. Well, thanks, uh, thanks, Speaker. And I want to uh, really thank the member for Northumberland, Peterborough South, for all of his uh, advocacy. He's done a oh, tremendous man. job for oh, his uh, riding during uh, the pandemic. And uh, I think, on behalf of his constituents, I want to extend my thanks to him for his advocacy. He's right, uh, Speaker. Restaurants and bars are a very important part of our economy and our communities. And we know that Ontario's patio season is short, so that's why our government is cutting unnecessary red tape and speeding up the process. Uh, I think it's critical. So we issued a, a new emergency order to allow municipalities to pass uh, temporary bylaws to create and expand patios to serve customers during this short patio season. Uh, our changes are going to shorten the approval time from uh, several weeks to several days. And, and I, I want to announce this as well, Speaker, because this is very exciting. At the request of Response. Toronto City Council, I issued a new ministerial zoning order to more easily expand patios across the city and to allow the launch of their new Cafe TO project. So my message to Ontarians is get out and enjoy a patio and a local restaurant this season. Thank you. The next question, the member for Essex. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, yesterday uh, the Premier refused to answer my questions. Uh, some really simple questions around how a private health care provider was given contracts to do mobile COVID-19 testing. Speaker, the Premier also refused to answer my questions as to how his former PC Party Caucus Executive Director, Jeff Silverstein, was able to secure a contract for this company, Switch Health. Speaker, instead of, instead of transparency, they dodged. If this government truly had nothing to hide, they could have done the right thing and, as I requested, uh, and tabled all relevant information on this contract. Speaker, today, will the government do the right thing and table all the documentation of how it selected this private health care company to handle COVID-19 testing? Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker, and I thank the member very much for the question again. In actual fact, what happened was the contract was given by Ontario Health. This was not something that had direct responsibility for the ministry. It was done directly by Ontario Health with a group it was Order. selected from a group of applicants, and that is how the contract was given. The supplementary question. Speaker, the government overlooked its own capable public servants in order to outsource to a friendly provider. Usually, and we certainly heard that before in the previous government, uh, the Liberal government, the arm's length uh, disconnection, but we, we know that the Premier is now playing from that same playbook, Speaker. Migrant workers and the whole region of Windsor-Essex deserve a coordinated public health care approach to get testing done months ago, not waiting after a private provider showed up with just the right lobbyist connection to get the Premier's attention. Speaker, today I wrote to the Auditor General to ask her office to review these contracts. The Premier has the power to order a review from the Auditor. Will he clear the air today and join me in asking the Auditor to look into this? Minister Health. 
assure the member, through you, Mr. Speaker, that the contract was granted in accordance with the required procedures that were necessary for this to happen, and that the people of Windsor Essex can be assured that they will receive the testing Order. in the way that they need it. We know that there still are a number of agricultural workers that need to be tested. They will be tested. We receive the reports on a daily basis about the levels of testing. And right now, Ontario for Essex stands come to order. as a leader in Canada here, here. on testing. We are surpassing over 20,000 tests every day. We are increasing our capacity to 50,000, and that is going to continue until we make sure that we have tested the agricultural workers and make sure Member that they are order. going to be safe and secure in their own homes. The next question, the member for Don Valley West. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And my question is for the Minister of Education. Um, I'm asking this question, of course, in my capacity as a politician, but I'm also asking it as a mother and a grandmother who is extremely worried about the well-being of children and educators of this province. There's an enormous amount of debate, and we've heard some of it this morning, around the reopening of schools. And a common thread throughout that debate is that everyone wants a full return to school, but not if the safety of children and school staff are at risk. I've heard government members say that. What is missing from the debate is a thoughtful proposal from the government on how those two might be reconciled. I'm hearing from constituents, parents who are worried sick that their children will not be supported in September. Mr. Speaker, if the government were willing to invest the necessary money in helping boards find community space, develop outdoor classroom space, hire additional staff to keep class sizes low, invest in the protective cleaning measures necessary, children could return to school safely full-time in September with smaller class groupings. It would not be easy. Question. I understand that. But it is possible with adequate funding. I ask the minister to explain to the children of Ontario why they are not worth that investment. Minister of Education, to reply. Uh, well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. The students of this province are worth investing, Speaker. $730 million more to do just that, to ensure that students in September, when they return, can do so with confidence that it is safe. There is more funding for PP, more funding for cleaning, more funding for custodial staff, more funding for more specialized teachers in areas of math, mental health, and special education. That is the reality, Speaker, because we acknowledge it is going to be increasingly difficult for school boards to operationalize these plans, given the risk. We also know, Speaker, and I appreciate the member opposite has acknowledged that the, the unknown of September, that we must be preparing and planning for all circumstances that may manifest the province. As we look globally into other jurisdictions that have reopened schools, they have seen challenges in France as well. And so the lesson learned is to be prepared for three circumstances. Indeed, daily conventional delivery is our preference. The investments will be in place, Response. the training will be in place, and of course, the continued support for all school boards will remain in place to ensure they can be safe in September. Great. Supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, well, that's very encouraging, but the trouble is we're not seeing the hiring that needs to be done. We're not seeing the planning that would need to be done. It's the middle of July. School starts the first week in September. Mr. Speaker, we started raising these issues in May. It's now the middle of July, and in the intervening weeks, there's a lot that could have been done to ensure a safe return to school. The implications of not getting the reopening of school right are different for different children. Children who were struggling before will struggle more now. The inequities that exist among kids have been laid bare and exacerbated by the pandemic. Schools need more support in order to be able to address those inequities. Most of the money that the minister has announced is money that was already going to schools. There's a little bit of new money, but most of it is a reannouncement of money that was always going, already going. That's not good enough, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, there is no successful economic recovery without the health and well-being of the two million students in Ontario and their families. Question. I ask the minister again why he is not working with teachers and their unions, support staff, administrators, school trustees, parents, students, and medical health professionals to determine the investments needed to provide for a safe, healthy, full school reopening this fall. Minister of Education. Uh, thank you, Speaker, and thank you again to the member opposite for the question. Indeed, Speaker, we are working with all stakeholders, federations, boards of education, listening to parents, and indeed the chief medical officer. I spoke to him as recently as last night to Dr. Williams to inform us on the way forward because at the end of the day, Speaker, our obligation as a government is to keep our children and our staff safe. We have an interest in ensuring kids could continue learning 
However, taking action to reduce the risk in September to the admins of their families and to the broader community spread that we seek to avoid. Speaker, what our government has done yesterday, for example, in childcare, is safely and methodically increase capacity based on public health data available to us that demonstrates that we can indeed cohort kids, keep them safe, and provide that assurance to parents as they return to the labour market that they can do so with confidence. Speaker, we're going to continue to seek the advice of the Chief Medical Officer, indeed work with educators and frontline workers to ensure that when they go back in September, they can do so knowing full well that their children will remain safe. The next question, the member for Carleton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Associate Minister of Energy. But uh, before I ask my question, I can't help uh, but, but comment. Uh, you know, it's 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 there's a reason that the Liberal Party is in the corner and in the penalty box because they they talk about our government investing in children. Well, where was the member for Don Valley West uh, when they shut down Munster Elementary School? <laughs> I'm going to ask you to stop the clock. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That was the question. So, the purpose of question period is for members of the Legislative Assembly to ask questions of the Executive Council and hold the Executive Council to account. They might be government backbenchers asking the question, they might be opposition members. But it's not to take pot shots back and forth across the, the floor against other members. So, I'm now going to start the clock and allow the member for Carleton to place her question to the minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, uh, could the Associate Minister of Energy uh, please talk about uh, phase one of our government's natural gas expansion program, uh, which is helping Ontarians in rural and remote areas and in Indigenous communities who have access to natural gas, giving them even more connections uh, coming soon. And our government knows that making uh, the switch from electric heat, propane or oil to natural gas results in significant savings. Uh, so could the Associate Minister please update this House on the status Question. of the natural gas expansion program? Associate Minister of Energy. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Honourable Member for, for Carleton for the question and the great work she does on behalf of the people of Carleton. We are making life more affordable for communities across Ontario through the Natural Gas Expansion Program, with projects completed and underway through the first phase of the program. Last year, I was honoured ple and pleased to announce that we would be moving forward with a second phase to expand access to natural gas to even more communities across the province. Mr. Speaker, the Ontario Energy Board is currently in the process of collecting information about expansion opportunities through Phase 2 and will develop a report on eligible projects. Due to the pressures faced by municipalities and utilities as a result of COVID-19 outbreak, our government extended the time for proponents to file their projects and their information. Proponents now have until August 4th to file project information to the OEB. Mr. Speaker, we know that municipalities and utilities across Ontario and the people that are going to receive these facilities and services are excited about this program Response. and we encourage all interested communities to partner with their local utility to submit projects for consideration, lowering the cost of their energy bill and providing jobs across our great province. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Associate Minister for that response. Uh, I wanted to also thank the Associate Minister and the Minister uh, who came to my riding of Carleton in February 28 uh, prior to the pandemic and uh, host a very informative roundtable to learn more about what our government can do to support the people of Carleton. And so I really appreciate hearing that update on the status of the program and measures taken by his ministry to accommodate municipalities facing increased pressure due to COVID-19. I know that many communities across the province think including my own, are excited about expansion projects that have connected them to natural gas and projects that are currently underway to connect even more communities. Could the Associate Minister please give us an overview of the benefits that communities in Ontario are seeing from this great program? Thank you. The Associate Minister of Energy, to reply. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and again, a great question, and, and thank you for inviting us firsthand to be up there and seeing what was needed in Carleton, and I'm pleased to say we're responding. Through the first phase of this program, unserved areas in communities like Chatham-Kent, Southern Bruce, the Chippewas of Tams, and Scugog Island are set to see the benefits of this program this year, Mr. Speaker. Residents in these communities will save between $800 to $2,500 on home heating costs, with businesses also set to see significant savings. Just last week, I was proud to announce up to $1.8 million to expand natural gas access to households and businesses in Saugeen First Nation through the natural gas with my colleague, Lisa 
Thompson. Residents and business owners are eagerly awaiting the completion of this project and are excited to get started. Mr. Speaker, the natural gas expansion program is making a real difference in communities right across Ontario. I'm excited that we are moving forward with phase two of the program, and I'm eager to get more shovels into the ground as quickly as possible and help as many people across this great province as we possibly can. Thank you, Speaker. The next question, the member for St. Catharines. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Garden City Manor is a long-term care home in my riding that is in the middle of another outbreak of COVID-19. At least 10 people are sick. Three have died. The home has been inspected 14 times. Let me repeat that, 14 times. And each and every time it was found that they had failed to comply with COVID prevention protocols. Speaker, staff are doing their best, but they are overwhelmed and they are run off their feet. Why won't this government commit to doing something, literally anything, to fix long-term care today? Lives are on the line here. Why? What are you waiting for? Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you for the question. Let me assure you that we are not waiting, and we have been actively working on creating a modern 21st century long-term care system that puts the resident at the centre ever since the Ministry of Long-Term Care was created in the summer of 2019. We have been at work addressing the neglect of the past 15 years, and that is no small piece of work, let me tell you. We have. We have, and we will continue to use, all our means to build capacity. Order. We will build capacity. We are in the process of using multiple solutions to create the environment for which our residents can be cared for with respect and dignity, and where staff can be appreciated for the amazing work that they do in long-term care. That is much more than anybody did for long-term care in the last 15 years. Every long-term care home has the duty to maintain standards of care. That is Response. not negotiable. And our government has conducted over 2,800 inspections. The 14 inspections that you refer to are through the public health units. That is a Thank you very much. A supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. The assurance has been over there for two years. Again to the Premier. Niagara Acting Medical Officer of Health is pointing the finger at both the government and the private for-profit long-term op care operators. He told us that what you are seeing is the systemic problems that have caused problems for long-term care homes in Niagara are playing here. And according to the medical officer of health, Rivera, the big corporation profiting off the care of our loved ones, only operates a, quote, skeleton crew staff. But still, the Conservatives continue to go out of their way to protect the bad operators like this one. What is it going to take? How many more lives? How many more families will lose a family member before this Premier finally Question. cracks down on these for-profit homes? Members, please take their seats. Minister of Long-Term Care to reply. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you, thank you for the question. The evidence is demonstrating that it is the systemic issues because of the neglect. We have ward rooms that are continuing to exist because the redevelopment did not occur under 15 years. The previous government only managed to build 611 beds between 2000. Uh, and 11 and 2018. And Order. that is the unfortunate reality that our government is dealing with as quickly as possible. The reality is that we are overcoming the shortcomings that were left behind by the previous government, supported by the NDP, including Order. the staffing. As I mentioned earlier, 21 reports on the staffing fixes that were required never acted upon by the Response. previous government, supported by the leadership of, of uh, the NDP. Older homes had more war beds. That is the problem. The staff was in a crisis. 
The next question, member for Ottawa South. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Speaker, yesterday the Premier announced phase three in the reopening of Ontario's economy. And for families and for our economic recovery, there's a piece missing, the single most critical piece. And that's a plan to get our kids back into school full time in the fall. Speaker, there is no plan to invest in our schools, no plan to invest in extra educators or extra spaces so we can keep our class sizes smaller and safer. There's no plan for students with special needs. Speaker, investing in our schools is actually the cornerstone of e Ontario's economic recovery. So, Speaker, through you, just like we invested in our hospitals in March to make sure that there was space and that they were safe, is the Premier prepared to do the right thing, the same thing for our schools? Minister of Education. Uh, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. Indeed, the Premier is absolutely committed to ensuring the safety of our staff and our students. It's the basis for why, Speaker, the government announced through the grant for student needs the highest and most uh, increase in investment in education ever in the province's history. It's why we, Speaker, have put more money in the GSN, the grant for student needs, to enable all school boards, public and Catholic, English and French, to succeed in September. It's why, Speaker, we have set up a command table of the best doctors in the province and country to advise school boards on their plans. It's why we've asked them to prepare for three circumstances out of abundance of caution, to ensure that no child's education is impeded because of the challenges of the outbreak in 30, 40, 70 days from now. Speaker, we are putting the investments in place. I accept the premise this is the most important thing a government can do is to protect our most vulnerable. It's why the money is in place. It's why the training, compulsory training, is in place for September. And it's why we continue to work cooperatively with Dr. Williams, the Chief Medical Officer, the command table, federations, and school boards Response. to get this right, keep kids safe in September. A supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. I appreciate the, officer, but the, uh, the answer from the minister. But he does know that his increase is related to increasing enrollment, and labour costs that have increased this year and last year. And it's not going to fix what we're talking about right now. No. So parents are concerned, and they don't want their schools to be like long-term care, where the government waited a month to raise the wages of the lowest-paid workers and to stop them from working in more than one home, or migrant workers. We've all seen the results in the government not doing what it needed to do when they knew they had to do it. And parents don't want that to happen here, and there's a big risk of that. So, parents, mostly women, have been carrying the freight since our kids have been out of school. It's affected their jobs and kept them out of the workforce, and that's bad for our economy. Speaker, through you, is the pre Premier prepared to do what's right for the economy and for our families and invest in a plan for our schools right now to keep class sizes small and safer and get kids back into school full-time? Minister of Education. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Uh, the answer, in short, is yes. The government will continue to make those investments in the school boards right across Ontario to ensure that our kids remain safe. Speaker, when I announced some weeks ago additional investments in schools, that was set aside to respond to the challenges taking place around us. For example, Speaker, we've seen, we've seen increased stress and challenges, mental health challenges imposed on our, on our students and our children in the province of Ontario. That's why, Speaker, in addition to the historic doubling of mental health funding one year ago, we've announced an additional $10 million to hire more psychologists, more psychotherapists, more social workers within our schools. That's why, Speaker, when we acknowledge the potential for students to have to be learning online, given the unknown of the fall, we've invested $15 million of new funding, Speaker, to procure tens of thousands of more devices. Speaker, we recognize that the challenges for school boards and likewise the ministry in preparing for September, but we will ensure funding is in place, training is in place. Response. So that we keep all of our staff, all of our kids, and most importantly, all communities safe in September. The next question, the member for Oakville North Burlington. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is this morning is for the Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. Minister, COVID-19 has affected so many Ontarians in different regions across the province, especially when it comes to their mental health. In many cases, Ontarians have spent the past few months isolated and alone. For the past few months, Ontarians have understood and supported our shared goal of stopping the spread of COVID-19 so we could move further towards reopening the province. Constituents in my riding of Oakville North Burlington are concerned about the mental health of their loved ones 
and they know we have taken and are continuing to take action. Minister, could you please update the members of this Legislature about the actions our government has taken to address the mental health of Ontarians during the COVID-19 outbreak? The Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addiction. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, thank you to the member from Oakville North Burlington for that excellent question. Mr. Speaker, I want to begin this morning by thanking the frontline mental health workers that have pulled it together and kept the people in the province of Ontario safe during this difficult time. They adapted programs. They changed to using uh, virtual services and online supports to deliver these services to Ontarians, and I, I congratulate them for the great work and the continued work they're doing. Mr. Speaker, the COVID-19 outbreak in Ontario has been difficult for so many Ontarians. The unfortunate reality is that in difficult times, there's a tendency when there, we have these disruptions and stress for people to not always look after themselves, and that includes mental health. That's why our government, under the leadership of Premier Doug Ford, took immediate action to respond to this challenge. We invested $12 million in mental health, and we've seen an expansion Response? of several notable online virtual supports, including Connects Ontario, Kids Help Phone, Good to Talk, and Bounce Back Ontario. And supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. And thank you, Minister, for that great answer. It's very reassuring to know that even during the COVID-19 pandemic in Ontario, our government has remained committed to making mental health and addictions a priority. Minister, we know that in addition to those Ontarians who may be exp exp experiencing anxiety and depression during these difficult times, many of our frontline workers may be experiencing burnout or even in some cases episodes of PTSD as a result of their heroic efforts during the COVID-19 outbreak. Minister, could you please tell us how our government has been supporting those who may be living with anxiety and depression, including our frontline heroes during the COVID-19 outbreak? The Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addictions again. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As part of our $12 million commitment to mental health during the COVID-19 outbreak here in Ontario, we made a significant investment to significantly expand online and virtual therapy options for those living with mental health challenges. This includes internet-based cognitive behavioral therapy for Ontarians, including our frontline heroes who may be experiencing heightened anxiety or depression. Since the very beginning of COVID-19 outbreak in Ontario, we've been working closely with the Mental Health and Addiction Centre of Excellence at Ontario Health, in addition to a number of hospitals across the province to develop specific services for our frontline health care workers. This Response? includes self-referral and intake services, weekly online peer discussion groups, access to confidential supports for clinicians, and ICBT supports as well. Thank you. The next question, member for Hamilton West, Ancaster Dundas. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Speaker. My question today is for the Premier. Uh, Eric Summer owns Spring Valley, a successful, innovative construction business in Ancaster. He's done everything possible to keep it open during COVID-19. He's applied for a Canadian emergency business account, accessed the Canadian emergency wage subsidy, and extended his line of credit. But after all that, he still owes tens of thousands of dollars in rent because his landlord is refusing to participate in the Canadian Emergency Commercial Rent Assistance Program. Now, his landlord is demanding payment in full. Clearly, the existing supports are not enough. Business owners are asking for and they need breathing room to recover from this crisis, and they need direct financial support, not just more deferrals and more debt. So why won't this government give that to them? Minister Finance. Mr. Mr. Speaker, and I, I appreciate the question from the member and would always appreciate hearing more about any specific situation. But, Mr. Speaker, this legislature knows that this government has been four square behind business through this very difficult time. That includes. That includes, Mr. Speaker, over a billion dollars in the program in our partnership with the federal government that the member references. That includes uh, an eviction uh, suspension of evictions uh, that my colleague, the Minister of Municipal Affairs, uh, led the way to support those businesses. And that includes our ongoing dialogue and discussions with business through a number of my colleagues, making sure that we're understanding what are the pressures that business are under. Most importantly, Mr. Speaker, that includes the safe reopening of the Ontario economy. 
and that's why we were so proud yesterday, along along with uh, with the experts in the health community, to talk about moving to phase three, Mr. Speaker, Response. so that those businesses are able to operate effectively. And we hope that that will be spread further across this province over the well weeks ahead. Done. And a supplementary question. Well, thank you to the Minister of Finance for this, his concern for small businesses. Um, and so I would say back to the Premier, uh, you know, I'm sure Eric would appreciate a call. So if you would like to give him a call to tell him how you're supporting him, I can provide you that information. I'm sure he'd be happy to hear from the Minister of Finance. But it's not just businesses like Eric who are suffering uh, because of this conservative inaction. Brian Sloat owns Expressions in Wood, a furniture business in Hamilton that is now being locked out of their business by a landlord who also refuses to apply for the rent relief program. Speaker, there's supposed to be rules in place to prevent this, but the government has said that they aren't going to enforce them. And instead, they told Brian to get a lawyer. Speaker, the Premier promised to crack down on bad landlords, but it's clear that their so-called commercial evictions ban is completely toothless. How many more small businesses will have to close before the government Question. finally starts enforcing their own rules? Again, Minister Finance. So, Mr. Speaker, again, if the member has, has specific examples of people violating uh, the very clear direction of this government. I appreciate her passing them along. But, but when it comes to speaking to business, Mr. Speaker, you know whether it was the Richmond Hill uh, Board of Trade, whether it was the Ajax Board of Trade, whether it was the Retail Council of Canada, the Scarborough Agent Corp Board of Trade, the Taiwan Canadian Business Board of Trade, the Ontario Chamber of Commerce, the Ottawa Board of Trade, the Markham Thornhill Board of Trade, the Duke Heights BIA, Mr. Speaker. That's just a partial list of some of the conversations, and these are just the ones that my colleagues have shared with me, Mr. Speaker. Our our government is in touch with business. We would like to hear about any concerns or anybody who is not acting within the rules, and we will take that very seriously. But small business, medium-sized business, business owners and entrepreneurs know that this government, under the leadership of Doug Ford, stands behind them through this difficult time. The next question is the member for Etobicoke Lakeshore. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question uh, is for the Minister of Children and Women's Issues. Speaker, it has been reported that the practice of birth alerts disproportionately affects racialized and marginalized mothers and families. Our government has heard from experience of birth alerts that can be traumatic and can increase mistrust and fear of child welfare and health care systems by those in Indigenous communities. For decades, these practices have deterred expected mothers from seeking prenatal care and parenting supports due to the fear of having their child taken away from them due to unfair practice. This minister has spoken in the House numerous times about wanting to make positive changes, especially for women and especially for the child welfare sector. She has spoken in and out of the House about keeping families together and working to end systemic racism. Mr. Speaker, birth alerts are a clear example of separating families Question. and form a systemic racism. Can the minister please tell the House what our government is doing about this discriminatory, sorry, this discriminatory practice? The Associate Minister of Children and Women's Issues. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member from Etobicoke Lakeshore for your advocacy of women and children in your riding. Speaker, the member is correct. Birth alerts have a long and ugly history of racial prejudice in Ontario and across Canada. Eliminating them is one of the recommendations of the inquiry into missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. I am proud to say that our government is ending birth alerts in Ontario. We have heard from Indigenous and racialized communities that this practice separates newborns from parents shortly after dis delivery and disproportionately affects racialized and marginalized mothers and families. No woman should be discouraged from seeking prenatal care or parenting support because they are afraid their child will be taken from them if they do. Going forward, the government is directing children's aid societies to end the practice of using birth alerts by October 15, 2020. This means developing collaborative approaches Response. that involve families, community partners and service providers working together for the betterment of children across Ontario. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the minister for that response and for acting against such a negative and harmful practice. We know that child welfare is in need of an overhaul, and birth alerts are just one part of that. It is unfortunate that racialized and marginalized communities experience this practice far too often. Even worse, 
Instead of celebrating a new child in the family, which is such an important day, these parents go through the trauma of fighting for their children simply because they were profiled. Speaker, this harms the family system and can lead to children being removed from their, ch their community and constantly moving. And we know that a children and youth do far better when they're in a stable home. Speaker, can the minister explain how this decision impacts the larger goal of transforming Ontario's child welfare system? Associate Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thanks again to the member from Etobicoke Lakeshore for this important question. Our top priority is the safety and success of Ontario's children, youth, and families. While we cannot go back in time, we can make progressive, Order. positive changes moving forward. This means developing a system that supports and protects mothers and children instead of being profiled based on racial identity, socioeconomic status, or other factors. Let me be clear. Hospitals and other public services still have a duty to report if they believe a child is in danger of abuse or violence. However, instead of taking a reactive approach, we are directing CISs and hospitals to collaborate and create new protocols which support families and mothers every step of the way. This is a result of ongoing engagement and consultation with partners across the sector, including those with lived experience. We are committed to building a child welfare system, not only for today, but for future generations. Response. Next question, the member for London North Centre. My question is for the Minister of Education. Speaker, I've heard from countless parents, business owners and students who are concerned about this government's lack of a concrete plan in September. It's like a bad choose-your-own-adventure book. Education should never be voluntary. Instead, a government should provide spaces for students to learn, as they are legally required to do, and make provisions based on advice from health representatives. Students should all be able to go to school with a plan to keep them healthy. One of my constituents, Christina, told me that this is not a realistic plan for parents uh, with families of pa two parents working full-time jobs. If students are to return with a model that includes 50% at-home distance learning, either my husband or I will have to reduce our work hours. Our income and careers will suffer as a result. Parents have made enough sacrifices during the COVID-19 crisis. Speaker, how can the minister propose a non-plan that demands parents sacrifice yet more? Minister of Education. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, indeed, we have asked school boards to be prepared for three scenarios out of abundance of caution, given that the member opposite, likewise his leader, will not know the uh, risk assessment according to COVID in 30, 60, 90 days. That's just the reality we face in Ontario. It's the reason why the majority of provinces of the Federation are in the exact same position of Ontario of requesting school boards to be prepared for a variety of circumstances, including online. I've said it before. You know, God forbid we need to go there. We need to close schools again. We were the first province in the country to do so to maintain health and safety. We will do so again if that's the advice of public health. The preference is conventional day-to-day -day delivery. We put investments in place. We have a training program in place for all schools. And we, of course, Speaker, are making clear that the advice and the decision point to send children back will be made exclusively on the medical advice of the best pediatric doctors in Canada to ensure that every student and every staff member remain safe in the province of Ontario. Supplementary. Speaker, this illogical adaptive hybrid model will not reopen our economy, nor is it good for education. The minister needs to plan for students to be there, all of them, safely. Speaker, the stress that London parents are feeling right now is made worse by the lack of affordable childcare spaces in this province. Nadia, one of my constituents, wrote to me saying, many women have left work indefinitely to care for children. This must be addressed and actioned upon. Dana, another London mom, agrees. She told me childcare remains the biggest issue and the government needs to address it. Parents are stressed and not sure how they'll manage and feel no reassurance from this government. Childcare and education are fundamental to the operation of our economy. When will the minister give London parents the assurances they deserve and release firm commitments to education and childcare in this province? Again, the Minister of Education. Well, Speaker, you know, the member opposite proudly hails from the Thames Valley District School Board, one of the boards in his community. I'm proud to confirm that $35 million more million is flowing in his community to ensure students remain safe in September. 
Speaker, that represents roughly $952 million in total funding for that school board. It's a, another proof point. The member from Waterloo, likewise investments in Waterloo, in Toronto, in Hamilton, every region of Ontario, Order. funding is up. And the reason, Speaker, it is so is because we recognize the challenges of reopening schools. We also look globally to other jurisdictions who have just done it in the past weeks. We recognize Order. we have to get this right. The single greatest preoccupation of government has to be the safety of kids. And I appreciate full well the impacts those decision points will have the labour market on parents. But all of us must, I think, prioritize as the single priority keeping kids safe. And that is exactly what we're going to do working directly with the Chief Medical Officer of Health. Great. Next question, the member from Mississauga Malton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My, Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Heritage, Sport, Tourism and Cultural Industries. Over the last few weeks, Ontarios have received exciting news when it comes to our athletes and as well as professional sports. Thanks, Minister, for your previous highlights. We know that Stage 3 will open up even more training and access to the games and sports our athletes love and champion here at home and around the world. Stage 3 will open up even more opportunities for the Ontarians to once again host professional sports for the competition and the championships that excite our country, builds up economy, draws us together and inspires us to challenge ourselves. Mr. Speaker, can the Minister please share the latest developments around the return of professional sports to our province and what Ontarians can look forward to as professional athletes get back to the ice, diamonds and fields? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Heritage, Sport, Tourism and Culture Mr. Speaker, Industries. Mr. Speaker, the member from Mississauga Malton has been an absolute champion, MVP, all star when it comes to return of sport and return to play in the province of Ontario. And let me be perfectly clear we are working with our professional uh, sport organizations across the, uh, Ontario, working with the CFL to get them to return to conditioning. We work with the MLB, uh, uh, and that's going to be very close to get our Blue Jays back on the pitch very soon. We are working with uh, the Maple Leafs, and I'm excited to say that uh, we're going to be a hub city in this province, in the city of Toronto. And of course, uh, we continue to work with the NBA in order to make sure that our athletes have been trained and conditions. I look forward to the supplementary. The supplementary question. Thank you, Minister. I appreciate your updates, and I'm excited to see some of our favorite teams returning soon, with caution as health and safety measures are our top priority. Mr. Speaker, we know that yesterday some major news were delivered when the Premier announced that the parts of our province were on track to join phase three of our province safe and gradual reopening of our economy. Both our professional and amateur sports are going to see really great measures that will help us define the new normal. From Research shows that sports boost self-esteem, develops leadership skills and discipline. From adapting our contact sports to training and gym facilities, our province is taking a lead role when it comes to welcoming back play to Ontario. Mr. Speaker, can the minister please share the good news that our athletes, sport fans, coaches, trainers, our children, our parents, our families can expect once their respective regions enter stage three? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Minister Heritage. Thanks, Speaker. That question really knocked it out of the park. At Ontario.ca backslash return to play, all Ontarians can check out how they can have a safe return to their sport across the province in Stage 3. And I'm excited in particular that uh, we're going to start to see youth sports return um, in every community some, at some point this summer so that we can get a return to, to normalcy. But I must say I'm very excited to start to watch our Toronto Blue Jays, our Toronto Raptors, our Toronto Maple Leafs, maybe not so much my Ottawa Senators speaker, and of course our three CFL teams get back to what they do best, which is bringing pride to the people of this province. Thank you. That concludes our question period for this morning.